male friends tend to not be as supportive as women friends, meaning that if you've disappeared or you haven't been seen for a while, somebody's likely to come to your house and see how you're doing, which is generally the way women do it. With men, somebody's likely to show up to your house at one if you owe them money, or two if you borrow tools and have never turned them back. And then uh, they're likely to get the surprise of their life when they see a skeleton sitting in the easy chair with a can of beer in his hand. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of Man Overboard Fitty. Ain't nothing but a number, yo, with your host, Language Barrel. On today's episode, we're going to be asking, how much do you need to retire? So the question before us today is, what do I need for retirement? It is not uncommon to hear the figure one to $2.5 million needed for the average American to retire. What we're going to do is we're going to kind of debunk that myth and to begin with stratifying some numbers based on age from 50 to 70 years of age. I'll give you the average amount of savings in the 401k and then I'll give you the median average of savings in the 401k for each age group. So if you're ready, let's get it, get it and get into it. Up first, age 50 to 55. So the average amount of money that Americans have saved in their 401k for this group is $161,869. Now you have to be careful about averages because outliers, either high outliers or low outliers can throw your number way off. And that's what's happening in this case. Some super savers are actually throwing this number up. So it gives the appearance that the average American has $161,869. $869 saved in their 401k when in all actuality we need to look at the median value which is the middle value or in this case the average value in this case the median amount of savings for a person 50 to 55 years of age is forty three thousand three hundred ninety five dollars when we look at 50 to 60 years of age the average one average 401k savings is one hundred ninety nine thousand seven hundred forty three dollars but the median amount in their savings is $55,464. Again, when we look at 60 to 65, you start to see a slight decrease. The average amount is $198,194. The median amount is $53,300. And then when we get to 60 to 70, that's when we start again to taper down. So the average amount of savings in the 401k is $185,858 versus a median savings of $43,152. So you see that median value is not even a third of what the average value is in savings. So in general, what they recommend, what I mean by them as economists, uh, financial planners, is that you save a minimum of 10 times your pre-retirement income by the time you get to 67. So Fidelity uses a ballpark figure. They say, let's say you were, your last salary was $100,000. Then by the time you retire 67, you should have saved a million dollars. Other people use a different rule. They use the 10% rule based on lifetime earnings. So based on your lifetime earnings, they estimate that you should have saved at least 10%. According to the article, this is in line with most Americans think or are aiming to do. This was by uh, October 13, 2023. However, in fact, statistically, only 10% of Americans have saved a million dollars or more for retirement. And that group tends to be the super savers, not high earners, because in America, we tend to spend to the level of our earnings. So that 10% of Americans who have saved a million dollars tend to be super savers, people that believe very much in saving and investing, irregardless of the amount of their income earned. Now, one thing you should be aware of is that for most Americans, their greatest wealth is in their homes. That is in the equity in their homes. And the problem with that is uh, equity does not generate any interest, any compound interest or interest in general. And in fact, in time, it is eaten away by inflation. So the article goes on to say that, uh, you know, you shouldn't feel bad if you don't have a million dollars saved in your nest egg, that regardless of your financial position, however, you should strive to save and invest as much as you can. Now, as we mentioned before, El Americans have their wealth in their property. Again, the problem with that, as we mentioned previously, is that, that that income sitting in their property does not 
generate compound interest or interest of any kind. Again, it's subject to deflation of the, the dollar. And also, in some instances, it could be considered speculative because that, that equity is based on someone buying the property at a certain value. And it's also based on your property increasing in value and not uh, losing value. And it's very much subject to the market. What I'm going to do is I'm going to also give you some cheap places, the cheapest places in the world to live. Uh, cheap places you could live on $400 a month. $400 a month. And those places would be Pakistan, Egypt, and Bataan. Now, uh, this article reference that you could actually live comfortably on $400 a month in these places. The problem, however, is that they don't anticipate that many Westerners or first world or industrialized nation residents would live there because of one, the safety to the quality of life and uh, three would be the crime or the lack of infrastructure. So what I've done instead is I've actually listed my seven places that I considered for retirement. And when I was looking at these seven places, I broke them down based on healthcare, crime, cost of living, weather, infrastructure slash travel, culture slash language. This is if you choose to live or retire outside of the US. So at first, I break it down by, by average salary after tax, average monthly cost of living, a one bedroom apartment cost, and this is all against the backdrop of someone receiving social security at uh, the average value of uh, $1,827. You start stratify these countries based on the income I need to retire in conjunction with my social security. So first up is the Philippines. After tax income, 317. Average monthly cost of living, 600. One, one bedroom apartment, 288. Stratification needed for retirement, 20,000 plus my social security. Thailand, $626 income after tax. Cost of living, 876. One bedroom apartment, 520. Stratification amount needed after tax, dollar stratification bracket. Mexico, average income after tax, 676. Cost of living, 786. One bedroom apartment, 427. This actually is in my $100,000 retirement stratification bracket. Next up will be Colombia, $300 average salary, $546 cost of living, one bedroom apartment, $427. Again, this falls in the $100,000 stratification bracket. Next up would be France, which is actually my number one place to retire outside of the U.S. Average after-tax salary is $2,502. Average monthly cost of living, $1,451. A one-bedroom apartment, uh, $720. This falls in the $250,000 IRA bracket. Spain was my second on the list, $1,798 uh, after tax salary. Average cost of living, $1,246. One bedroom apartment, $669 uh, for one bedroom apartment. This falls in the $250,000 uh, bracket for my retirement. Italy would be the third on my list, $1,675 after tax income. Monthly cost of living, $1,320. One bedroom apartment, $644. Again, this falls in my $250,000 bracket uh, needed for retirement plus my social security benefits. I just put the US up here just so you have some comparison and values. So after tax salary was $4,865. Cost of living was $3,625. The 2.5 times the cost of my other highest choice on the list would have been, which would have been France at 1451. Uh, one bedroom apartment, $1,372. And again, uh, I don't have any stratification for this because the US is not uh, on my list for possible places to retire. So now if you are money conscious and you're looking to retire in other countries outside of the US for cheaper cost of living, then you would want to look at Asia, uh, the Philippines, Vietnam, Thailand, Latin America, that would be Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Dominican Republic, or Panama. If you're looking at Europe, you want to look at Poland, Romania, Portugal, and Montenegro. Now, the only problem with most of these places on the list, by all of them with the exception of Great Britain, is that English is not the first language. 
but if you want to look at retiring in the United Kingdom, which is 7.7% cheaper than the cost of living in the U.S., however, the pound is much stronger than the dollar. So even though your cost of living is cheaper, you're probably likely to see a 15 to 25% pay cut or cost of living uh, increase just based on the strength of the pound against the dollar. Now what I've also included in this video, I've included a, a map called the cost of living by country map. I've included the link so you would just hit the link, click on the map anywhere in the world and for that specific country it'll give you the cost of living. It will not do it by region, it'll just do it by country. Now what about if you don't want to retire outside of the U.S.? What about if you are committed to staying in the U.S. for retirement? Middle class people, middle class is probably going to be the most difficult place for people to retire and it's because the government offers little or no assistance for middle class wage earners. So if you're going to require some type of assistance, you're going to be required to spend down your assets in order to receive government support. Now if you own your own home, women have been doing this for a lot longer than men. Women seem to be uh, smarter when it comes to end of life decisions than men are. You probably want to follow the example of women who for the most part live in communities, especially as they age, and men tend to live in isolation. You definitely want to take in boarders or renters, or you probably want to look at things or, uh, that are not in use up for sites like Airbnb, which you can uh, generate some income from like these home sharing type of websites. And the good thing about Airbnb is you're only required to list it uh, when you want to. So if you don't feel like having boarders for a specific period of time, then you just mark the property as unavailable and you don't have to worry about that. But it'll definitely, one, help to increase your income, decrease your cost of living, and also if you're a person that doesn't get out a lot, it'll offer some socialization as people come and go through your property. Next we wanna talk about, uh, if you're retiring in the US, we're gonna talk a little bit about healthcare, especially about men. So men tend to be very poor health uh, maintenance custodians. They don't really uh, pay attention un to their health until they've get gotten to a point where they're in crisis. The one thing that is pretty synonymous with retirement, even more than income, is health. So generally poor health equals poor retirement. Don't be one of these men, which as a rule are many in number, uh, that uh, die in isolation. Take a, take a lesson from women and uh, try to increase your social networks when possible. Um, because even if you do have friends, male friends tend to not be as supportive as women friends, meaning that if you've disappeared or you haven't been seen for a while, somebody's likely to come to your house and see how you're doing, which is generally the way women do it. With men, somebody's likely to show up to your house, if one, if you owe them money, or two, if you borrow tools and have never turned them back. And then, uh, they're likely to get the surprise of their life when they see a skeleton sitting in the easy chair with a can of beer in his hand. The other thing that do it, you need to do if you're going to stay in the U.S. is you're going to need to find some way to reduce your auto costs, which tend to be a very high driver. I think it's probably one of the second highest costs or third highest costs um, for users behind probably health care and home ownership. But there are some websites that you can actually lease your car out when it's not in use websites such as Toro, where people will rent your car for a day or two or a couple hours and pay you some money. Uh, not only will this help to defray some of the costs of your living, but it'll also defray the cost of uh, the auto, help to uh, support you with auto maintenance, so on and so forth. Now there are still some places in the U.S. with cheap costs of living. I have a list that I'm going to read through the list very quickly. I'll also put the list on the screen so you can follow along. It's actually from another website and you'll find the link uh, below the uh, the link is listed below the actual chart the cities are ranked 1 through 11 uh, there's also median household income is captured median price is captured and population the reason that we capture the median home price is because in many times the cost of living is driven by the either the price that you're paying in a mortgage or the price you're paying the rent I also list populations in this chart because populations are usually indicative of the services provided, whether that's going to be public transportation, easy access to health care, medical care, um, restaurants, uh, grocery stores. They're all very usually very closely tied to population. Median home price 
which is $412,000. This is as of September 2023. So now we'll work our way through the chart, which is entitled Cheap Places to Live in the U.S. Uh, this chart was actually not created by me. It's created. I pulled it off a website, so the link to the website is listed below. So up first, Fort Wayne, Indiana, median home price $53,000, median home price $130,000, Population 162,000. Number two, Buffalo, New York. Income 42,000. Median home price 112,000. Population 276,000. Number three, Wichita Falls, Texas. Income 50,000. Median home price 109. Population 102. Number four, South Bend, Indiana. Median income is 46,000. Median home price 95,000. Population 100. And two also. Number five, Topeka, Kansas. Income fifty thousand. Median home price one hundred and six. Population one hundred twenty-six thousand. Number six, Evansville, Indiana. Income forty-six thousand. Home price one hundred three thousand. Population one hundred seventeen. Number seven, Toledo, Ohio. Income forty-one thousand. Home price eighty-seven thousand. Population two hundred seventy-one. Number eight, Brownsville, Texas, 43,000 income, 95,000 home price, 185,000 population. Number nine, Akron, Ohio, 42,000 income, 87,000 home price, 191,000 population. Number 10, Erie, Pennsylvania, 40,000 income, 91,000 home price, 95,000 population. Last. Uh, number 11 is Dayton, Ohio, income 37,000, uh, median home price 73,000, and then population 138,000. Like most places around the world, large percentage of the population are moving to urban environments for employment opportunities. So as a retiree, if you're willing to make a reverse commute to a smaller community, not only will you have a cheaper cost of living, but you also may find that you have an increased quality of life. And remember, achieve something different. Believe something different. Conceive something different. Read something different. But most importantly, be something different. The world is waiting. Thanks for stopping by, and we'll catch you on the next episode. Ciao for now.